So, oh, hello everyone, uh, and welcome to my talk. My name is Konrad Szokowski. I'm a Java developer with 14 years of experience. My main areas of interest are Java as a language, but also a JVM as a thing that runs that language. Moreover, from time to time in the evening when I sip certain type of drink, I wander also to the world of the GPU, GPUs and parallel computing, parallel programming. Privately, I'm a husband and a father. This takes most of the time. Uh, in the free time, I also go hiking and sailing. You can find me on the, this Twitter handle. I tweet from, some, from time to time, especially when I find something interesting about GPUs. Uh, if there will be any questions, please uh, submit them to the Slido, uh, to, to our uh, Geekon channel, hashtag, how you call it, in the Slido, I know. So, how to make your electrons do more in Java? Yeah, so how to certainly squeeze the most from our machines using Java as our primary language? So there are few magic spells when it comes to the computer programming that allows to run things faster on your machines. Those spells are known to the code wizards, like, for example, Yarek. Uh, can someone tell me what are those words? Does someone recognize those words? Yeah, close enough. Those are CPU instruction mnemonics. Yeah, so let's have a little competition. First one, yeah, what does it do? What you put the bet on? Yeah, addition. Second one, subtraction, exactly. Mo third one, multiplication. And the fourth one? Sorry? Ah, good. We have one specialist there. And the fifth one? Yes, exactly. But they are not typical instructions. Those are simped instructions, which means that you have a single instruction operating over multiple data. So what does it mean, in short? So imagine we have a set of numbers, we want to add them. So what would normal Java developer do? Normal Java developer takes and creates accumulator. Yeah, initializes with it with zero, and then adds a first element, adds second element, add third element, add fourth element. Four operations needs to be done to achieve some result. What would code wizard do? Code wizard would pack them together in some structure uh, and re execute exactly one operation, vreduce add, and get its result. This structure, this array, is often called a vector. So where we can use vector operations? Both integer and floating types, yeah? So for sure you know they are used in games, yeah? Every, three, uh, every 3D game is based on the math done with the vectors, with matrices, uh, with, oh, I forgot the fourth name. Then we have a simulations, yeah? So every type of simulation, like fluid running through some streams, like uh, aerodynamic simulations of the planes, there are lots and lots of floating point operations there, which can be parallelized and sped up with such instructions. Imaging, where you can find more easily four numbers together that are joined and can be computed together, yeah? Those are pixels on your screen, R, G, B, and alpha. Same goes for computer vision. And, the famous buzzwords of last month, artificial intelligence. Yeah, so whenever you have a neural network, you have neurons in there. Those neurons connect to other neurons, 
and those neurons connect via some weighted edges between them. And the weights there are all floating point, so it can also be easily parallelized with simple instructions. But let's stop for a short history lesson to give you a background. How is our situation as Java developers? So go back to the, in your memory to the year 1996, those who can, of course. Uh, but that time, Java is young. Yeah, James Gosling and his friends and Sun Microsystems are about to release first version. Release those versions on the uh, NetStop devices, on the Blu-ray, uh, Blu it was the name, I think, Blu-ray disc players, and so on. Java was not meant at that time to be a general purpose language. Yeah? At the same time, in our homes, in our PCs at home, the Intel Pentium, is dominating the market. What is Intel Pentium? Intel Pentium is a successor of 486, so the, the, the CPU which revolutionized personal computing. It's faster than this, thanks to its superscalar architecture. Superscalar architecture means that you can process many ways of the code together, and this is what makes uh, Pentium faster. It has its downsides, it has its bugs even, yeah, the hardware can also have a bug, and this is much more serious than its software, of course. And after that, one year later, it's 97, and the Intel Pentium MMX comes into our homes. Yeah, it offers bigger cache, it offers branch prediction you need. And for me, as a gamer back then, it offers MMX. What was MMX? MMX was the one of the first commonly used SIMT instruction sets that came to our homes and immediately was utilized by the industry of entertainment. Yeah, I don't know. Back then there was like one game for me personally, which I loved, Swift. Yeah, it was about flying helicopter uh, and destroying some targets. Pretty simple, pretty st stupid game. However, you were, we were enjoy, uh, enjoying ourselves together with my cousin, but there was one difference. He had an MMX CPU, and I didn't. So we played always on his machine, because the game was much more sparkly, much more joyful there. And MMX became that successful, also thanks to the gaming industry, that it spawned many, many children buzzwords. Yeah? So you had 3D Now, an AMD answer to the uh, MMX you got SSA from one to five. You got AVX, Altivex, the or the neon, uh, neon uh, SVE. Those buzzwords all mean the same. They are names of the instruction sets uh, called of SIMT instruction sets. Yeah, those vectors which they operate on in those sets only differ by the type you can help in these objects and the size of those vectors. Meanwhile, in Java, we have addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, modulo, always on two operands. Yeah, so we are pretty much poor with what we can do with our numbers, with our computations. But has SIMT instruction been ignored completely? I would lie to you if I would say yes. They are present in Java. There are so-called super word optimizations. Uh, those are the types of optimization that your C2 compiler can do when you are running your uh, when, when it is running your code. For example, when it sees some certain pattern in the code, it can exchange this pattern with the pre-compiled platform native CPU code. Yeah, and this code most often contains simd instructions just to speed up things. And moreover, uh, JV, there's the thing called JVM intrinsics. Those are instructions which JVM and Java more or less delegates to the native code. They do not ex execute them by themselves by the bytecode. 
uh, those instructions like RI copying, RI filling, uh, RI comparison, those also are based quite often in the JVM implementation on the SIMD instructions. But since Java 16, I don't know if you know, we have Vector API. So Vector API is an answer to the call of some developers that we want to have access to the SIMD. .NET, ha .NET has it. C, C++ programmers, they are, it is daily bread for them. But we in Java also want access to those instructions. And our demand is simple and explicit API. And we want it to compile directly to the SIMD code. We don't want bytecode in between. Yeah, we don't want to bother that it is slowing us down. And they have achieved it. There, are f there were a few jabs with every version of Java since Java 16, which improved this API. And actually, they have achieved it that we are having access to the, um, to the SIMD instructions in Java. But there is a cost, no free lunch. And let me show you quickly what is the cost in this case. So from where you start each journey in each API? Yeah, in Java. From factory. So we have also in the vector API uh, such factory. It's called vector species. Vector species is an abstraction over the type of elements held by the vector and the size of the vector. So for example, I want to have a vector of integers which are being held in 128 bits. So can someone tell me quickly how big the vector will be? How many, how many bytes are there in the integer? bits, 32 bits, but four bytes, yeah? And after that, 128 bits, it is 16 bytes. Four divided, uh, 16 divided by four, four. Let's have our species and let's check this. Let's create a zero vector. Oh, sorry. This is when you change from Mac to normal machine. Okay, let's spit it out. We have a, a, that one. four zeros. Yeah? And you can see we have one easy abstraction, generic abstraction over the vector. What else can we do with our vector? We can, for example, add to all elements of it some number. Let's have it a three. Yeah? And vector API is immutable. So anytime I perform some operation, I'm spawning a new object. Yeah? So let's see how it worked quickly. It's three. We can then, for example, multiply one by another, etc., etc. But most of the time, you will not probably operate like this on the vector. Yeah, because those are very simple computations. You will most probably have a large amounts of data. And this large amounts of data will need to be loaded to the vectors to operate on this data. So how we load, for example, 123 integers. Uh, quickly, we have an array, and we want to spit it out. Just to prove you that they are random, quickly, yep, an array. And now we want to roll this array. We have magical 
factory method called from array. And I'm passing here my ints. And I want to start from index zero. However, it will now eat me only for integers. How you eat the whole array? Within the loop, of course. So you have a loop. You have a helper method, which allows you to not to jump out of your uh, from your array, uh, because then you will get array index out of bounds and exceptions. Yeah, I'm bounding my for loop int, and then I'm moving by the length of my vector with my offset. Vector species length. Yeah. Vector species from array int. And I'm moving my offset there. Yeah, quickly to show you that it loaded. But then you will ask me. What the what the what with the remaining three, and this is a problem. Sadly, we need to handle them by ourselves. So we need to have our offset shared between the loops, and then we need to operate on the rest of the elements ourselves and do some operations on them. Yeah, to do. That's all. Then, question, what does it give us, this big amount of code? I've prepared a simple demo to, uh, to quickly show you what benefits there are. Simple vector operations demo. So we have a summing uh, of, uh, we have an array of 100 million integers. Uh, we are summing it manually, but then we are also summing it using naive vector uh, implementation. Then we are searching for the max in the array, and then we are searching with the max with the reduction uh, instructions uh, from vector API. And then we have naive solving th 30 million of quadratic equations. So let's quickly, let me quickly show you what numbers we are talking about. Summing scalarly, in the scalar way, 26 milliseconds. Scumming with the vector API, 20 seconds. Searching for max, 36, with vector, 20. And then quadratic equations. And those all are naive algorithms. And you can still see that they are significantly faster than normal computations, that normal sequential Java API, with the low cost, because the implementation is very easy. OK, let's go back to the demo. So what are the pros? So it's a simple model, as you saw. It's very explicit. And it's, get you, it's getting you a significant speed up if it is used properly, not in a naive way. If you are you know, crunching it, you can get even more than I showed you here. Cons, sadly, we as a developers, Java developers do not love to write a lot of code, but still this API requires us to do. Uh, not all SIMT instructions are also covered within the API. The dictionary is very big. We have additions, negations, shift lefting, uh, etc., etc., and lots of, lots of instructions there, but not all. This is because the architecture of underlying CPUs are also different from one another. And of course, little disclaimer, SIMT instructions can be less accurate than your normal floating point operations. For me, as a Java developer, who is also interested in some low-level things, is why now? 
why freakingly after 20 years, because Java 16 was, I think, almost 20 years after the premiere of Java, they suddenly started, okay, thinking, okay, give them the API. And I can only speculate in here, yeah? I can speculate that the Intel, who is exactly behind those jabs, behind those APIs, uh, had thought, okay, people with this artificial intelligence will start to use many, many more SIMT instructions, but they are not enough developers on the market to address the needs of the artificial intelligence boom. Then let's give access to the SIM to one of the biggest communities of developers, which there is, yeah. Java may be not the king anymore, however, still there's plenty of us to do the work in the artificial intelligence. But another question is, for me, can we squeeze even more from our machines using Java? Can we utilize GPUs? Can we utilize our graphics cards in Java? Yeah? And you will say, GPU programming in Java? Is this guy crazy? Like, is he out of his mind? No, I'm not out of my mind. It's a pretty valid question. Because let's compare those two things. CPU. CPU sitting here. Intel, Pentium, something, blah, blah, blah. One core, sometimes more. Here, six. Control unit, which is controlling the flow of the code, loading, uh, input, output operations, interruptions, uh, interaction with uh, hardware, etc., etc. A cache and a DRAM. Yeah, this is simple model of your machine. While there's the GPU, they also have cores right now. Cores and cores many, many of them. The numbers right now are going into thousands. They have also control units, however, much more restricted. You, no one, I think, saw a uh, hard drive attached to graphics card. And another benefit, not, over, not only the cores, you have specialized caches. Yeah, there are different types of caches in your uh, graphics card, which, if utilized properly, can also offer you significant speedups. And the GPU, the graphic card, has also RAM, also quite significant amount of this. But the problem is not Java, it's not a language. The problem lies that those two worlds have different architectures, that those two words require separate memory management. Yeah? You have RAM at your PC and you have RAM in your graphics card. Moreover, in the graphics card, there is no good nanny that cleans this memory for you. There is no GC there. And you can easily hurt yourself if you are doing memory management yourself. And there is different programming model uh, for uh, GPUs. The GPU programmers think a little bit differently. We usually, as a Java programmers, we, we feed the data to our computations. Yeah, you, here you have an array of integers, compute it. Yeah, iterate over it. Uh, search in it, do a, I don't know, addition of the elements. While GPU programmers tend to, okay, I have a data, and now I need to position my computations within this data. And judging on my position, I'm computing something. And of course, there's also a problem of many platforms. Just to give you a few, CUDA, OpenCL, the, I would say, hopefully a standard of uh, GPU programming in the future. OpenACC, 
and others, just to give you a few names. And there were attempts to integrate uh, graphic cards into Java. It's not new topic. I have, I'm not discovering anything new. And there are actually uh, libraries called the JCUDA and JOCL. Both those libraries are mainly mappings to the uh, API of already existing libraries, which are there available on the market from the um, GPU uh, producers. There were also two projects from Oracle, Project Sumatra and Project Rootbeer. Uh, both died, sadly, uh, because of lack of developers. However, Sumatra was focused on giving you, as a Java developer, an access to the API, which will allow you to put code into the graphic card, yeah? to put the code in the GPU. However, you still would need to prepare this code in the language which is understandable by this graphic card, to compile it in the quite low-level C-like language. While the project Rootbeer was solving the other problem, yeah, F to giving you a way to compile Java into the CPU, uh, G uh, GPU understandable code. Moreover, there was uh, also interesting projects like Job, Maxeller, both focused on the FPGAs, another set of devices which is capable of massive parallel computations, however, with different architecture than. GPUs, but still. But there's a new boy in the block. This new boy is called Tornado VM. Tornado VM is developed at the Manchester Uni uh, University of Manchester, and the guys there are giving you to a Java developer a proposal how to utilize this parallel, massive parallel computing devices uh, in your simple Java code. They are offering the same programming model for SIMT CPUs, so you will be utilizing SIMT instructions out of the box. You will be utilizing GPU code, and you will be utilizing FPGAs. What they do, they have two approaches of giving you the compiled code, compiled GPU code. They are compiling for you the Think that it, I think the most closest in Java to the C code, C language, the static methods. Yeah, it, you can do this via annotations <laughs> uh, or via kernels. And actually, annotations are useful in this in this part if you watch the previous previous talk. T what just for you also to understand what Tornado VM is do? It is not giving you a holy grail. It does not detect parallelism. It doesn't automatically parallelize your code. It uses your hints how to parallelize your code. OK, let's jump quickly. Yeah, we, can we have plenty of time. Uh, let's jump quickly to annotation approach. And let me show you how it is done. For example, we have two arrays, A and B. We want to add them into the third array. So what we do? We fill the first array with some numbers. For example, tens. Second array with the twenties. And then we prepare execution on the graphics card. Yeah, it's not out of the box that I will say this needs to be executed on the graphics card. I need to prepare a little bit. I'm constructing a task graph. So it is plan of my computation. Then I am feeding my data to my device. Yeah, I'm transferring the source arrays. Next thing, I'm passing the task, the computational task, to uh, to GPU. Yeah, so I'm giving a, a reference to the method which I will be executing, and I will uh, I'm feeding also the arguments, and I'm transferring back the results from the graphics card to my machine. After that, I take a, a, how to say, a snapshot of this plan, and I say, 
Tornado, execute this for me. But how does my method look like? If you want uh, to add two vectors, what do you do? Yeah, Forget about seamed instructions for a while. We do a for loop. Yeah, we are iterating from the first element to the last one, and we are adding those two arrays together. And we just say, tornado, the, those iterations, those code uh, batches within the for loop are quite independent. You can try to say, you can try to execute them in parallel. You give an annotation and that's all. And let me quickly compile this to you. Oh, I should make this. Uh -huh. Let's spawn the tornado. I need to uh, do a bit of a recompilation. And that's all. Tornado took Java code, compiled it into the GPU understandable code, loaded the data for you into the device, computed there, and returned you the, the, the result. In normal GPU programming, it would be a lot of you to worry about. Uh, let's give you. Uh, let me give you one more thing. Why you should bother about tornado? Let me show you one th simple uh, benchmark run. I will show you how my CPUs are behaving, how my GPU is behaving, and I will start a thing called ray tracer. Oh. This we haven't tested. Let's check it how it looks like. Okay. <laughs> what is Ray Tracer? Ray Tracer, it is a simulation. Oh, let me quickly adjust also the screens. Uh -huh. For you to show it all. I think the scaling is here to blame. Yep. Now it should look better. So what we have here, oh, it isn't scaled. <laughs> Once again. What is Ray Tracer? Ray tracer is a simulation of human eye. In short, we simulate a ray of light falling onto every pixel of the uh, of the image shown in here. Yeah, so we have a pretty much simple scene uh, in 3D. Uh, five balls, floor, and the source of light. We are running this right now on the CPU without any optimizations. And you can see we are barely pulling one and a half FPSs. When we try to go to parallel streams, okay, it's, I want to like to show you that it is actually using for joint pool. All the uh, all the all the CPUs got busy. We are managing to pull astonishing three frames per second. And if we increase any parameters of the image, for example, we will have much nicer shadows, or the ver we will have more reflection bounces, the performance drops significantly. But when we try to go to the GPU with the same settings, 
and doesn't break a sweat. Let me quickly show you back how it looked like on CPU with this randomized positions. Yeah, not that astonishing. <laughs> so the GPUs gives us an advantage. However, they require quite a some work to run things. However, Tornado, what Tornado does, it hides the most painful uh, elements from you. It hides driver loading. It hides memory management. It's doing a little GC there in the background for you and allows you to focus on the code to execute. Moreover, there's quite a neat feature there. It's called dynamic reconfiguration. Where what does this feature do? It while it compiles this Java code into the GPU code, it can judge whether this code will execute faster on GPU or not. If it doesn't execute faster on the GPU because of times that it takes to load data to the GPU memory, yeah, still we have this problem that through to the GPU we are talking via very narrow PCI Express and transferring few gigabytes to its memory may take time. So whenever the Tornado VM judges that this transfer will take too much time, it will not do this. Yeah? It, if it judges that if you want to run, the, the, if it running on the CPU will be faster, it will run this for you. You don't need to focus on which device to execute this code on. Moreover, there's a also third player there in the field. Yeah, there's CPU and there's GPU, and external GPU. However, lots of uh, new CPUs, new Intel CPUs, have their GPU integrated together on the same chip. And the rules of access to the memory apply both for the CPU and for the integrated GPU because they are on the same chip residing there in your device. What are pros of Tornado? GPUs for Java geeks. Yeah, so we can finally use these GPUs, harness the power which is lying there. And this is now, you will tell me that, okay, but we are running our code in AWS. In AWS, there are also EC2 instances which offer you an attachment to the graphics card. And you can bet that this graphics card, which is there, it's much more powerful than the one which I have in my laptop. However, the pro is still th is also the con. This very simple programming model doesn't allow you to express very big and complex computations. However, it's at least something. And for this something, you are spared other pains. And there is lots of boilerplate code to start a task. Sadly, but it's required. OK. Thank you. And I will switch now to the questions. I will just close it because it starts to boil in here. All right. Rigsby, SIMT, or other hardware, wait, sorry, <laughs> hardware support. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, personally, I haven't uh, sort of uh, dived into the risk uh, topic. Uh, I wonder if they will also uh, address this in the Tornado, because it's, I would say, similar to the problematics of the FPGAs. Uh, yeah. Does Tornado work for other JVM and non-JVM languages also? Tornado works for Python, for Ruby, uh, Groovy, Kotlin, Scala, of course. Uh, moreover, Tornado is the design in the way that it is uh, Graal VM. Uh, it is utilizing Graal VM to actually compile this hardware native uh, code to be executed on whatever machine. And they are actually 
uh, Graal VM implementations of Ruby, Scala, F, or whatever computing language that you have there. 